Uh, an anomaly which often struck me in the character of my friend Sherlock Holmes was that although in his methods of thought he was the neatest and most methodical of mankind, and although he also affected a certain quiet primness of dress, he was nonetheless in his personal habits one of the most untidy men that ever drove a fellow lodger to distraction. <laughs> Not that I am the least uh, conventional in that respect myself. The, the rough and tumble work in Afghanistan, coming on top of a natural bohemianism of disposition, has made me rather more lax than befits a medical man. But with me there is a limit. Holmes! Holmes! Really? Holmes! There. Not bad, eh, Watson? It's a wonder to me Mrs. Hudson doesn't turn us out into the street, Holmes. It's all very well you're keeping cigars in the coal scuttle and tobacco lying about in the toe end of a Persian slipper and sticking your unanswered correspondence to the mantelpiece with a jackknife, but really, I do think pistol practice belongs in the open air. Well, Watson, I must say I'm surprised at you. A natural patriot like you should be proud to have VR adorning your sitting room wall. In bullet holes? <laughs> Holmes, you're incorrigible. Just look at this room. Oh? I hadn't noticed... Well, then it's about time you did. Chemicals all over the sideboard, criminal relics. Ugh, that thing in the butter dish. I do wish you'd get it out of here. Oh, is it still there? Of course it is. Well, before weeks of it's left to you to get rid of it. And all these papers everywhere. Oh, if the time's lying heavy on your hands this evening, I suggest you do a bit of sorting out here and now. Well, come to that, I'll give you a hand. Oh, well, in the interest of peace, <laughs> let me see now. Ah, yes. Yes, this old tin trunk should have room for a bit more. <laughs> so long since I opened it, but I seem to remember... Ah! Yes, I've quite forgotten. Oh, no, don't start taking things out of it. Watson, if you knew what was in here, I think you'd want the whole lot out. What are they? The records of your early work? Yes, my boy. Oh, these were all done prematurely before my biographer had come to glorify me. Oh, oh your early cases. Oh, Holmes, I've often wished I'd notes of some, some of the... Some pretty little problems among these. The Tarleton murders. Oh, good. The case of Banbury, the wine merchant. A full account, Watson, of Riccoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife. Well, if I might just have a look at And the here are. Now, this really is something a little recherche. What is it? It looks like a box of toys. Here you are. Open it for yourself. Thank you, Crumpled bit of paper, an old-fashioned brass key, a peg of wood with a ball of string attached, and, uh, and three rusty old discs of metal. Well, my boy, what do you make of this lot? Well, it's uh, a curious collection. Very curious. And the story that hangs round it will strike you as more curious still. Well, these things have a history, then. They are history. They're all I have left to remind me of the episode of the Musgrave Ritual. You'd like to hear about it, no doubt. Well, I said... What? And leave all this litter lying about? Oh, come on, Holmes. Don't rag. So be it. Well, I've told you before how when I first came down from the university, my leisure time was all too abundant. Now and again, cases came my way, principally through introductions from old fellow students. Well, one day, I had a visit from one of them named Musgrave. Reginald Musgrave. The MP, the, the Sussex Musgrave. Quite right. Yes, he came from one of the oldest families in the kingdom. And, you know, I never looked at his pale, keen face or the poise of his head without associating him with grey archways and mullioned windows and all the venerable wreckage of a feudal keep. <laughs> Holmes, do go on. Well, now, he'd always been interested in my methods of observation and inference, but I hadn't seen anything of him for four years until he walked into my room one morning. My dear Musgrave, do take a seat and tell me how all's gone with you. Oh, pretty busily, Holmes. You know, I became member for my constituency when my father died a couple of years ago. I had heard something. And I have the Hurlston Estates to manage, of course. Uh, but you, Holmes, I understand you're turning to practical ends those powers which you shall maze us. Yes, 
I've taken to living by my wits. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. I, I don't mind saying I I'd be glad of your advice. We've had some pretty strange goings on down at Holston. The police have been able to throw no light upon the matter. Oh, only two peas to help you, Musgrave. Let me hear the details. Well, you must know that although I'm a bachelor, Hurlstone's such a rambling old place, I have to keep up a pretty big start. Naturally. Altogether, there are eight maids, cook and butler, two footmen and a boy. The, the, the garden and stables have a separate staff, of course. Of course. Now, of these servants, the one who'd been longest in our service was Brunton Butler. He was a young schoolmaster out of work when he was first taken up on our father. But he was a man of great energy and character, and he soon became quite invaluable to us. But uh, this paragon has one fault. He's a bit of a Don John. Ah. However, a few months ago, we were in hopes that he was about to settle down. He became engaged to Rachel Howells, our second housemaid. But he's thrown her over since and taken up with the head gamekeeper's daughter. I see what you mean about it. Uh, poor Rachel's a good girl, but of an excitable Welsh temperament. The business gave her a sharp touch of brain fever until yesterday she was going about the house like a black-eyed shadow of her former self. And is this the curious business you speak of? Well, that's only part of it. The first drama of Hurlston was driven from our minds by a second one. Also concerning Brunton? Yes, I'm afraid, sir. One night last week I found I couldn't sleep. I rose and lit the candle, intending to go on reading, and then realized that I left my novel downstairs, so I went out to get it. As I was approaching the dining room, I saw light coming from the open door of the library. Well, my first thought was burglars, and I took an old weapon off the wall before I went to see who was there. Who, who's there? Who is it? It is I, sir. Brunton. Brunton? What are you doing here at this hour? What have you got there? Uh, uh, just uh, a map, sir. A map? Look here, that girl of drawing this. Would you mind telling me what the devil is going on? It's nothing, sir. No, nothing, I assure you. Those are some of my family's papers. What are you doing with them? Well, I... So this is how you repay the trust we have reposed in you. You will leave my service tomorrow, Bantam. I... Very well, sir. If I may say one word, though, sir. Well? Mr. Musgrave, sir, I... I can't bear disgrace, sir. I've always been proud about my station in life. Disgrace would... would, would kill me. If you cannot keep me after what has happened, then I beg you to let me give you notice and leave this house in a month, sir, as, as if of my own free will. Frankly, Brunton, you don't deserve much consideration. Your conduct has been most infamous, sir. However, as you have been such a long time with the family, I have no desire to bring this grace upon you. A month is too long. Take yourself away in a week and you may give what reason you like for going. Only a week, sir. Say at least a fortnight, please, sir. A week. And you may consider yourself to have been very, very leniently dealt with. Very good, sir. These papers he was studying, what were they? Well, to my surprise, there was nothing of any importance at all. Simply a copy of the questions and answers in the Musgrave ritual. The Musgrave ritual? What's that? Uh, there's a sort of ceremony peculiar to our family, which each Musgrave, for centuries past, has gone through upon coming of age. I see. Oh, but pray go on. Well, for two days after this, Brunton was most assiduous in his attention to his duties. On the third morning, however, he didn't appear as usual after breakfast to receive my instructions for the day. As I left the dining room, I happened to meet the maid, Rachel Howell. Why, Rachel, you should be in bed. You're not over your illness yet. Get along with you and come back to your duties when you're stronger. I, I'm, I'm strong enough, Mr. Musgrave, sir. We shall see what the doctor says about there. Now, you must stop work at once. And when you go downstairs, just tell Mr. Brunton I wish to see you. Oh, Mr. Brunton has gone, sir. Gone? Gone where? Well, just gone, sir. <laughs> no one has seen him. He's not in his room. Oh, yes. He's gone. He's gone. <laughs> yeah. There was no doubt about it, Holmes. He had gone. His bed had not been slept in. He had been seen by no one since he retired to his room the night before. His clothes, his watch, even his money were in his room. But his black suit, which he usually wore, was missing. His slippers were gone, too, but his boots were left behind. Indeed? Well, we searched from cellar to garret, but there was not a sign of him. I called in the local police, but without success. They examined the lawn and the paths all around the house, but there was not a trace of his footmarks. Is that all? Well, not quite. 
There was yet another development which quite drew our attention away from the original mystery. Oh? What was this, then? Rachel Howells collapsed and became delirious and sometimes hysterical. I had to employ a nurse to sit up with her at night. On the third night after Brunton's disappearance, this nurse came bursting into the library. Mr. Musgrave, sir. Oh, Mr. Musgrave. Yes, nurse. What is it? What it's happened? the girl, sir, Rachel Howells. Well? well? She was sleeping so nicely, and I just thought I'd take 40 winks in the armchair, but when I woke up just now, she disappeared. Disappeared? How do you mean? But just disappeared, sir. The bed was empty, and the window was open when I looked out of it, and you could see her footmarks going away across the lawn as clear as anything. Oh, Mr. Musgrave, I'm terrified she's gone to the lake. The lake? Surely you don't think... Well, in her state, I don't know what to think. She was so demented at times, I wouldn't put anything past her. Come along with me quickly. We must get the police onto this at once. Well, the police started dragging the lake at once, but no trace of her body could they find. But they did find something else rather curious. Oh, what was that? Well, it was a linen bag containing a mass of old rusted and discoloured metal and several dull-coloured pieces of pebble or glass. Uh, and that was all that could be found. And from that moment to this, we know nothing of the fate either of Rachel Howell or of Richard Brunton. Musgrave, I must see that paper. Uh, which paper? The one your butler thought it worth his while to consult, even at the risk of losing his place. Well, it's rather absurd business, this ritual of ours, but I, I have a copy with me, if you care to run your eye over it. I should like to very much. And what was it all about, Holmes? Uh, if you straighten out that crumpled ball of paper you found in the box, Watson, I think you'll find the Musgrave ritual written down on it. Hmm? Oh, I see. A sort of, um, catechism. Questions and answers. Uh, whose was it? His who is gone? Who shall have it? He who will come? What was the month? The sick from the first? Where was the sun over the oak... Where was the shadow under the, the elm? <clears throat> How was it stepped north by ten and by ten, east by five and by five, south by two and by two, west by one and by one, and so under? What shall we give for it, all that is ours? Why should we give it for the sake of the trust? That's all, Holmes. Yes. You'll have observed, of course, that the spelling puts it in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, yes, yes, of course, yes. Not to be much help to you in solving the mystery, eh? It provided me with another mystery even more interesting than the first. I sensed that the solution of the one might prove to be the solution of the other. Uh? It pointed to one thing with certainty. Oh, what was that? It showed that Brunton, the butler, was a very clever man indeed. A man with a clearer insight than ten generations of his masters. So Musgrave had no idea himself what this ritual business was all about. None whatever. He asked me if I could tell him. And could you? I told him we should be leaving for Sussex immediately, and I would do my best to find out. Well, there's the oak tree for you, Holmes. There are plenty more about the estate, but nothing as old as this one. My word. I don't think I've ever seen a more magnificent tree, Musgrave. Oh, a patriarch among oaks. Was it there when your ritual was drawn up? Well, I should say it was there at the Norman Conquest. It has a girth of 23 feet. Remarkable. Well, then, let us assume that this is the oak referred to. Have you any old elms as well? Well, there used to be a very old one over yonder. It was struck by lightning ten years or so ago and cut down to the stump. You can see where it used to be, though. Oh, yes. There are no other elms? Well, no old one. Then I'd like to see exactly where this one grew. It was over here. On the wall. I see. I suppose it would be impossible to find out how high the elm was. Well, I can tell you now. Sixty-four feet. My dear Musgrave, how on earth do you know that? Well, when my old tutor used to give me exercise in trigonometry, it always had to do with measuring heights. And when I was a lad, I worked out every tree and building on the estate. Well, that's a piece of good fortune for me, then. Tell me. Did your butler ever happen to ask you about the height of the elm? Well, now you call it to my mind, he once did. It's in connection with some argument he was having with the groom. Now, this was excellent news, Watson. It showed me that I was on the right road. Yes. What did you do next, then? I looked up mm. at the sun. It was low in the heavens, and I calculated that in less than an hour it would lie just above the topmost branches of the old oak. 
I see. Where was the sun over the oak? Oh, yes, yes, part of the ritual. Exactly. And the shadow of the elm must mean the further end of the shadow, otherwise the trunk would have been chosen as the guide. I see. So I had to find where the far end of the shadow would fall when the sun was just clear of the oak. Oh, that must have been difficult. The elm was no longer there. True. But if Brunton could do it, I could. Besides, there was no real difficulty. What? Oh. I went with Musgrave to his study and whittled myself that peg you see in the collection there. Uh-huh. I tied that long string to it with a knot at each yard. Then I took two lengths of a fishing rod, which came to just six feet, and I went back with my client to where the elm was. It's lucky the sun shone for us today, Musgrave. Look, it's just grazing the top of the earth. Well, what are you doing now? I'm, uh, I'm fastening these two lengths of the rod together. <coughs> there. Now, I stand it on end where the old elm used to be, uh-huh. and you, Musgrave, take this knotted string and measure the shadow thrown by the rod. I see. Uh... One, two, three. Well, it it comes to a third knot, three yards. Nine feet. Now, a rod of six feet throws a shadow of nine feet. So, by a simple calculation, a tree of 64 feet will throw a shadow of 96 feet. Uh, Yes. Now, following the direction of the shadow, we use the string to mark out 96 feet. If you'll just lend a hand... Ninety-three, ninety-six, and we mark the spot with this peg. Well, we're almost at the wall of the house. Yes, and look at this. What? Is that the person in the garden? If I'm not mistaken, that mark was made by Brunton when he'd completed his calculation. Well, on his trail, Musgrave. Well, this is incredible, but, but, now? We take the cardinal points with my pocket compass. Yes. North lies over there. Now, you recite the directions from the ritual, and I'll paste them. Um, north by ten and by ten. Ten steps with each foot towards the north. Yes. East by five and by five. East by five and yes. South by two and by two. By two and by two. That takes me right to the door. And west by one and by one. Well, that could only mean one step with each foot into the house. May I? Of course. I'll open the door for you. And so under. Under this floor. Unless my calculations are radically wrong. Hmm. The cement between these flagstones is perfectly intact. They haven't been moved for many a long year. Well, at least Brunton hasn't been at work here. Uh, Just a moment, Holmes. You're thinking in terms of having to dig, but there's a cellar under here. A cellar? Yes, as old as a house. Then come along. Down here. Uh, Through this door. There's a candle on this barrel. This place is used for storing wood. Yeah, that's better. Look, the wood's all been pushed against the walls to leave a space on the middle of the floor. What's that tied to the iron ring in the flagstone? A, a muffler, I think. That, that, that's Brunton's muffler. I've seen it on him. I, I, I could swear to it. He, he's used it to help him heal up the stone. Uh, come on, Holmes. Uh, just a moment, Musgrave. Huh? I think we've reached a point where we should pause a little while. But why? All we have to if do you'll it. take my advice, of course. you'll send for the county police to be present when this stone is lifted. Uh, you think so? I do. <laughs> in fact, from the look of it, we should be more than glad of their assistance in lifting it. Muffler or no muffler. Now then, Constable. Yes, sir. You take one end of the muffler... I got it, sir. And I'll take the other, and we'll heave the stone up by its ring. Now. Ready, sir. (coughs) 
Now, please shine the lantern into the hole, Mugsy. Ah! Oh. <gasps> Good Lord. It, it's London. Can we get them out? We must. Uh, I'll get them, sir. Uh, won't be room for two of us. Thank you, Constable. Now, uh, sir, if you'll reach them. Yes. Right. I. I got him. Right, sir. Uh, uh. Well, I, I think it's, it's London. His face is uh, rather. Yes, I, I, I no doubt about it. He's been dead several days. Hmm. No signs of any injuries. No, nothing at all. Sir! Yes? There's a box down here. He will lie across it. A box? Uh, we'd better have it up. It, it's heavy, sir. Come in. Uh, come in out, sir. Right. I, I have it. Asian looking in. We'll examine that shortly. Is that all, Constable? Yes, sir. Then... Take my hand, and out you come. You knew you would find Brunton down there then, Holmes? I appeared as much. But now I had to ascertain how that fate had come upon him, and what part had been played in it by the woman who had disappeared. Rachel Howe. Hmm. I sat down on a keg in a corner and thought the matter carefully over. Well, you know my methods in such cases, Watson. Mm -hmm. I put myself in the man's place. He knew that something valuable was concealed. He had found the spot. Yes, but how did he get into it? Exactly. Whom could he trust to help him? The girl? She had been devoted to him. A man always finds it hard to realize that he may have finally lost a woman's love, however badly he may have treated her. Yes, he would try by a few attentions to make his peace with the girl, Howell, and then would engage her as his accomplice. They would come together to the cellar at night, and their united force would suffice to raise the stone. Yes, but, Holmes, you said that you and the constable found it hard enough. I, I mean to say, a girl. Ah, I realize that. And I asked myself, what would they do to assist them? Almost at once, I came upon what I expected. Uh? A billet of wood with marked indentations at one end. Obviously, it had been used as a lever, and then as a prop to keep the stone upright. Ah, yes, I see. Yes, then Brunton dropped into the cavity, and the girl waited above. Then what? He unlocked the box. That's his ancient key you have beside you there. Ah. And he handed its contents up to the girl. I should tell you that it was virtually empty when we examined it. Yes, yes, yes. Logical enough. And then what happened? Ah, Watson. What smoldering fire of vengeance had suddenly sprung into flame in this passionate Celtic woman's soul when she saw the man who had wronged her in her power. Was it by chance that the wood had slipped and the stone had shut Brunton into his sepulchre? Had she only been guilty of silence as to his fate? Or had some sudden blow from her hand dashed the support away and sent the slab crashing into place? Great heaven! I seemed to see that woman's figure still clutching at her treasure trove and flying wildly up the winding stair with her ears ringing perhaps with the muffled screams from behind her mm. and with the drumming of frenzied hands against the slab of stone which was choking her faithless lover's life out. And this was the reason for her hysterical behaviour the next morning. But Holmes, this, uh, this treasure trove she took away, you, you said they only found a bundle of old metal and pebbles in the lake. Well, as to that, my client Reginald Musgrave provided the clue. Oh. Yes, Bunchy? These, these two coins, all, all of them in the box. I've just realized that they're Charles I. You see, we were right in fixing the date of the handwriting of the ritual as mid-17th century. Charles I? Yes. Musgrave, quickly. I must see the contents of the bag they fished out of the lake. Well, it's up in my study. Come on, then. We may find something else of Charles I, Musgrave. Now, what are we here? Not very encouraging, are there? Metal's almost there. Hmm. Shaped in the form of a double ring, but twisted and bent. And the stones are dull. But let me try rubbing one of them on my sleeve. Oh, yes. 
No, it's beginning to come up. Why, yes. There's almost a place of sparkle. You must bear in mind that when the royal party fled, they probably left many of their most precious possessions buried behind them, with the intention of returning for them in more peaceful times. My ancestor, Sir Rafe Musgrave, was a prominent cavalier. He was the right-hand man of Charles II in his wandering. Ah, indeed. Well, now, I think that really should give us the last thing we wanted. I must congratulate you on coming into possession, though in rather a tragic manner, of a relic which is of great intrinsic value, but even of greater importance, as an historical curiosity. What, what is it, Hope? It is nothing less than the ancient crown of the kings of England. The crown? Precisely. Consider what the ritual says. How does it run? Whose was it? His who is gone. That was after the execution of Charles I. Then, who shall have it? He who will come. That was Charles II, whose advent was already foreseen. I think there can be no doubt that this battered and shapeless diadem once encircled the brows of the royal Stuart. But how is it that Charles didn't get his crown when he returned? Ah, there you lay your finger upon the one point which we shall probably never be able to clear up. It's likely that the Musgrave who held the secret died in the interval, and by some oversight left this document to his descendant without explaining its meaning. From that day to this, it has been handed down from father to son until at last it came within reach of a man who tore its secret out of it and lost his life in the venture. And that's the story of the Musgrave ritual, Watson. What an astounding business. But what about the missing woman, Holmes? Nothing was ever heard. The probability is that she got away out of England and carried herself and the memory of her crime to some land beyond the sea. Oh, bless my soul. Look at the time. Oh, goodness me. Oh, dear me, Holmes. <laughs> No doubt you will wish to add the Musgrave ritual to your chronicles now that I've given you the particulars. I most certainly shall, Holmes. Capital, my dear Watson. Then, as you'll be needing all these things to refer to, I suggest we simply leave them where they are and tidy them up another day. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs>